welcome to Coffee and Conversations. First things first, my name is Freddie Nordhoff. I am originally from Seattle, Washington. I now own and operate a coffee shop, which you see behind me, called South End Grind in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I've been living here for seven and a half years. Basically, what I want Coffee and Conversations to be is a long form conversational style of TED Talk. I sit down with someone, we have some really good coffee, and we get to talking about the things that get them inspired. And hopefully, people find something of interest and value in the conversations that we have. The first guest I had come on this show is Jeff Dugdale. Jeff is the head men's and women's swim coach at Queen's University of Charlotte. Uh, I first got to know Jeff when I was still a student at Queens. The swim office was right down the hall from where the golf office was, so we passed each other a number of times. And, and based on a short conversation we had, I, I, I thought he had a lot of really interesting things to say. It was actually when I was voted to become the captain of the men's golf team at Queens that I started having weekly meetings with Coach Dugdale of the swim team. Um, because I really admired his approach to leadership and I thought there was a lot that I could learn from him um, seeing that he was a successful, effective leader and I was trying to kind of build some of those habits in myself. So when I had the idea for this, this concept, this podcast or show or whatever it's going to become, he was one of the first people I wanted to talk to. He's got a wealth of knowledge and experience in, in leadership. I know that when I've talked with him in the past, I felt like there was so much that I could learn from him. Now, my conversation with Jeff, I actually recorded about a week and a half ago. It was my first attempt at recording anything with a uh, camera, um, and I actually ran into some technical difficulties just because I was super inexperienced, um, so I ended up having to finish it up on the phone. Um, I can only hope that future conversations I have, uh, the quality, and uh, the tech and the recording side of things will get better and better and better. Without anything further, I uh, hope you guys enjoy this first episode with Jeff Dugdale. I know I certainly enjoyed sitting down and talking with him. It's been a few years since we've been able to connect. Going forward, I am really hoping to come out with new episodes on a weekly basis. So again, enjoy this first episode and stay tuned for more coming soon. Uh, welcome to the first episode of Coffee and Conversations. I'm sitting here with Jeff Dugdale, who is the swim coach at Queen's University. He leads both the men's and women's program, and he has since it first started back in 2010, 2010 which was also <coughs> my first year at Queen's. And that's kind of how I tell people about Jeff, is that when I first started at Queen's, we you weren't allowed to recruit, correct? No, I was I was allowed to recruit. Um, it was just we started it at very late date uh, in April when most people had already committed and signed at a lot of places. So, so there was, uh, if I remember correctly, there was like maybe a dozen, two dozen swimmers at the most. There were a lot of total knock on or walk off or walk ons, excuse me, and um, there was the lap pool in the ovens. And that was it. Well, and it, it, even a little bit more extensive is uh, I got a couple transfers and a couple new freshmen. The rest were I found on campus. Mm -hmm. And we had the ovens, which was we turned into a four-lane pool mm -hmm. and put some windows in, invested $13,000 to put some new windows in so it would look like something we could recruit. And the pool um, basically broke. And so we had to train at downtown, at well, four different places downtown. And so after investing that money, and it was our own money, it wasn't school money. And uh, yeah. and we uh, we lost it all, they tore it down then. Yeah. Uh, long story short, you know, just talking about where the swim team was when it started, by the time I graduated, which was five years later, you had just repeated as double national champions with the men's and women's team, which is, um, you know, coming from a broken, lap pool with you know windows that you had to pay for yourself to uh to double national champions two years in a row which, um, is a testament to the way the program kind of came together under your leadership i think i appreciate that um you're from wisconsin how did you get into swimming yeah uh i just told the story not too long ago it's a it's a pretty humiliating and embarrassing story but um 
Uh, I think it's important because it was a lesson I learned. Um, as we know, there's team sports and there's individual sports, and swimming falls under that individual sport. But I, at my size, I'm, I'm a pretty tall guy. Uh, I always and excelled, was pretty athletic and excelled in uh, playing football, baseball. Didn't even really like baseball, but because of my size, I was asked to, to come and, and play in a game and, and stood up at the plate and not knowing what to do, hit a home run and, and just like kind of like, what do I do from here? <laughs> but it was always so much bigger than everybody else that um, I would happen to be fairly uh, good. It was fake it till you make it, but I, I had an advantage. So I was playing one basketball one day in a game, and uh, and uh, I got uh, pretty angry at uh, at a situation we were losing. I hated to lose, <clears throat> and I felt I look back now, I probably felt out of control because I I couldn't put it all on my shoulders. There were other people that were missing shots, or I mean, were missing passes, all that stuff, and the way I acted. My mom took me off the court and said I wouldn't play team sport. I mean, I was going into doing something that um, was more of an individual sport, and specifically because of my uh, actions and my language, not necessarily, I don't remember swearing or anything, but mm -hmm. I guess the way I was calling people out, which mm -hmm. could have been embarrassing, she said she was going to put my head underwater in swimming so that then I could only be mad at one person if I didn't do well, and that was myself. So that's how I got into swimming. And on top of the fact that my <clears throat> sister swam, my family, uh, my neighborhood swam, and so I kind of got thrown into the mix with that as well. Is that effective parenting or just out of necessity? Like <clears throat> I, think gonna... <laughs> it, I think it's effective parenting, parenting when I look at knowing what your child needs. And uh, I, you know, I've, I've watched my daughters um, uh, progress through mm -hmm. athletics as well. And, um, and I knew right away what would be good for them or wouldn't be good for them and you you kind of start to see where they thrive um i have both daughters ended up um, my eldest was um thrived in tennis mm -hmm. and but my youngest is in the team sport she's in lacrosse but uh um, swimming was um in and out for them because they didn't in the individual part of it and under they were more social butterflies wanted to lead and want to be in groups and yeah. and different things so you've got to, I think what happens in the effective parenting question is that do we notice? And I think any leader or anything that you do, you have to notice your, you have to notice the people that you're leading. And if you don't notice that they're not happy, if you don't notice that they're not thriving, if you don't notice when they do thrive, then what happens is um, you could lose that leader. You can, they won't follow anymore. Mm. So. Now you, like I was reading through your bio the other day, um, have you held jobs outside of swimming? Yes, yes, I've, I've gone, I, I've taken, as you probably know in life, there's traditional paths mm -hmm. and then there's non-traditional <laughs> paths. I've always seemed to flourish in non-traditional paths. Um, I actually went to school, pre-med, wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, chose Auburn, oh. um, not only for, um, for many reasons, but uh, they were pretty famous at the time for their orthopedics and, um, and their uh, team doctors. At that time, the Houston Clinic and then Dr. Andrews, known as the Million Dollar Doctor, Dr. James Andrews. Mm. And, um, and, and I always, even in my senior year of high school, I used to go into surgery and watch hip replacements and, um, and work on the rehab part of everything. As a senior in high school? Yeah, so I, did, I didn't really have to go to school my senior year. I, I took a class. I would go, I took a child development class and went to a preschool and uh, worked with kids and then went into the OR and watched a couple surgeries um, uh, with, uh, with a, a local physician who was a mentor, Dr. Shapiro, and then had a, another mentor in um, Dina Lorenzi, who had worked with um, Michael Jordan at UNC yeah. and uh, and a lot of different people. And Dino has been a great friend of mine now to watch his son as a trainer of Ohio State football and yeah. and uh, all the different things. Um, we <clears throat> He was able to, he, he taught me the value of mentoring. He said, let's let's really do some things before you decide what you want to so that you can go through. And as I was working through that, I knew I had a love for medicine, but I also knew that I had a love for marketing and business mm -hmm. and coaching mm -hmm. and um, sales, and that's coaching is sales. And uh, and eventually I had, I had um, 
fallen in love and, and, and took the non-traditional path then. Well, first of all, I should back up. The first non-traditional path was when uh, Coach David Marsh asked me, the Auburn coach at the time, asked me to retire and become his recruiting coordinator still mm -hmm. as a student. Mm -hmm. So he said, I want to win national championships. I think you can help go out, identify that talent, and bring it in. And I was a junior in college. Yeah. So then we went through that route, and then I met, a, as it happens, I met a, a female and um, got married and uh, figured coaching couldn't support our family at that time. So I went into pharmaceuticals and blended my science and my coaching, went up the ranks in that, and then came back into coaching later in life. Gotcha. So, so I actually wanted to get into your experience at Auburn. Good. Um, you and Coach Marsh started there very similar times, correct? I started a year before he did. Okay. Well, now, he <clears throat> he was a swimmer there um, in the 80s mm -hmm. with Rowdy Gaines and with a lot of the great um, the great teams, Richard Quick, uh, Olympic coach. And, and um, he uh, then he went off and started coaching. And when I came to Auburn, he um, our our coach quit at the end of the season and our yeah, mid season. And um, and they brought in David um, to become the coach. He was thirty one years old. And uh, I remember this young guy. And I remember our first meeting. And uh, not many not many lasted after that first meeting because he was very clear we were last. We were terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, and he said we were going to win and, uh, and, and kind of shared a vision and made it, simplified it for us. I'll never forget how he simplified it. He simplified it and said, it's going to be as simple as 20 words, 10, or 10 words, 20 letters. Mm. If it is to be, it is up to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were going to take that responsibility and we were going to follow his lead. And he said he would be an advocate to anybody who went left on their own. And uh, so we could start a program and get themselves out of the way. And people left. I mean, it was crazy being one of the few. And then in the end, when we started to work our way through, and four years later, we won our first uh, conference championship. Right. And then um, then we won 12 national championships after that. Yeah, so. which is pretty darn good. And yeah. the, the conference championship, that was like the first of 17 in a row, correct? Yeah, 17 in a row, 19 total. Uh, um, yeah. 1994, so was our very first, uh, and we, we created that year, and it's interesting because we just did something similar. That year, we built a one by four, and we said we would be number one in four, 94, and we would clap that about, it was a clapper, two woods that came yeah. out of the wood, and we yeah. signed it, and we would clap it every day going in the locker room, mm -hmm. and but it seemed so far away. Nobody could see that vision, but you just had to tr blindly trust it and just go into it. And we did it, and um, it was so great to see that. That kind of ignited me to say, if you have a strong vision and you and you go in and you believe and you buy into it, mm -hmm. what can happen? And then from there, that in, um, we started recruiting first. I mean, these athletes that could come in and win national championships. And at that time, Stanford, Texas, you just couldn't see. But sure enough, we went in and won our first national championship in '97. Then, mm -hmm. with um, one of the first classes I recruited. Man, so when when Coach Marsh first came in, what was that transition like from the previous <laughs> culture where there wasn't a lot of winning to then yeah. four years later winning conference and national championships? It, it was. Uh, was it as simple as that first meeting where he said, "Hey, this is this is the way, this is the route we're going to take, and if you don't want to be on board, then I'm happy to help yeah. you in other ways." But I wish it was that simple because there would be um, <laughs> there. I, I wish it was that simple, but nothing's that simple, right? Um, uh, Coach Mars was trying to, I think, you know, we look back and laugh now, but um, I think he was trying to fake it till he made it too. Um, and one of the things is when you're young and when you're um, going through there, he meant every word and he knew exactly in his mind where he wanted to go. Mm -hmm. But the way he conveyed it was very um, authoritarian. And, uh, and it was kind of like, well, man, you've got to be a little bit empathetic to us that we came in, you know, we came into an Auburn and right, you're going to pull and change the rug. Now, I didn't feel that way, but I heard my teammates saying, um, and they wanted to start to rebel and they wanted to fight back a little bit and they wanted to, um, they, they definitely, uh, some of them didn't value how winning would help them academically so they were like if I wanted to do that I would have gone to a Stanford I would have gone to a different place and I chose here because I felt I could balance it a little bit more well what happened was coach Marsh was um so he had to earn 
some respect and very similar to our path here at Queens is you, 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 it's like a game of horse. You got to call the shots mm -hmm. sometimes. And when they see the shot happen, mm -hmm. then they're like, you gain another step of trust. So a little bit of your business school, have you ever dealt with Jahari's window? No. Okay, Jahari's window is an interesting thing to look up, but it's a pain, it's blind spots, it's unknowns, it's called the arena. Okay. And it's four squares if you look at a um, the way a window pane, basically how it's set up, is that this one, the arena, is very small, mm -hmm. and everything else is pretty big. And what your goal is, is to how do you make the arena very big and then minimize your blind spots, your challenges, mm -hmm. and your critical unknowns. And what happens is, and how you do that, is you start to gain trust. You gotta give something to get something. So when he became vulnerable, then we gained trust and gave him a little bit. And as he learned more about us, he then started, for an example, I can only speak to myself, is then he started to identify strengths and, um, uh, potential that I had no clue that I had, mm -hmm. but just who I was. And that's why he asked me, and I still wonder to this day where I would be in life if, because I have never known anybody else to do this, um, to if he went and identified me and said, you're still a student, but I want you to be on my coaching staff. I have no idea what how life would have been different. But I became a coach and had to separate myself from the friends and yeah. um, but all in the purpose of a bigger vision to mm -hmm. win. Now, if I want to be selfish and still swim, I could have done that. But for some reason, he convinced me how I was going to have a bigger impact in life if I did this, and it was pretty crazy. So that that kind of leads me to two of my next questions: Is what was that transition for a from a competitor to a, a leader, a leader to a coach, coach recruiter? Yeah. What was that transition like? And then when. What was a turning point for you? Because you said you would never have thought that, you know, you yeah. would be on so, so what was a, so what the, point did you know that you wanted to stay in coaching and stay in swimming? Okay, so there's, that's a great question <laughs> with a lot of twists and turns. Mm -hmm. So first thing was, is that um, I wish now I have a friend in doing her master's in um, finishing this next week and she's actually working on a project with the Hornets on how to retire. <laughs> how do you transition, right, in yeah. that, that transition? And I'm fascinated with her work because of the fact that I think to all of our Olympians, I think to our swimmers, I think to myself when I was making that transition. I didn't have a playbook on what to do, right? So I probably alienated a lot of people. I probably didn't know, I mean, not knowing a lot of things. So with that said, I started to move down this path and, um, and I got really focused into my work and um, into recruiting, into identifying talent. And I think uh, kind of my first light switch that went on was um, Coach Marsh not knowing really how to develop me either because he just knew I had this talent, mm. but how to corral it was, um, he was busy doing a lot of things. So he loaded my arms, he asked me to put my arms out, he loaded my arms with Zig Ziglar tapes. Have you ever heard of Zig Ziglar? I have, I have, I'm not, I haven't. Yeah, it's basically Zig Ziglar is famous for a loaf of bread has two beginnings, not two ends. A lo um, he, he says um, your attitude determines your aptitude. Um, your um, he, he, um, he, he's the one who taught, I mean, everything's a, it's a positivity. Zig Ziglar is one success story after another. Mm -hmm. I went and had breakfast with him one time. And um, what he did, Zig Ziglar is, um, it, it, Zig Ziglar is famous for when you're in the morning, it's an opportunity clock. Alarm clocks are bad. Alarms mm -hmm. are signal something's wrong. You, when that opportunity clock goes off, you hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. And he's just filled with energy. So I started listening to the tapes because that was my onboarding. That was my learning. And I started to get involved into more tapes. And I wanted to hear more. Mm -hmm. Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. different things. I wanted to hear and listen to every success story. And then I started asking myself, the next little flag was, I found myself asking questions. Why? Why can't I do that? Why Why would I not make a good leader? Why would I make a good leader? What could I do? And I just started, my senses, my um, everything started to pop up. And then when I started to achieve some success um, in doing some things, I was like, wait a second, this is, I like this. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to fast forward because then I left coaching because to get married and do right. the different things. And then... 
in, 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 in leadership development and training and the different positions I held, I kept starting to recognize I was being asked the same question. Mm -hmm. And the same question is, why do you do what you do so well? You're like in a zone. You're like in your strengths. You're thriving, right? Mm -hmm. And I started to, um, I started to ask myself, well, if I'm being asked that question, I better formulate an answer because if you're going to lead, if you're going to be make give presentations, you've got to be able to tell people. If you're going to lead others, you got to tell them how your steps you took. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that awareness, it's a recipe for disaster. And so what happens is when I started to put down my thoughts, it all came to one thing. It came back to coaching. It came back to swimming. What it taught me, the discipline, mm -hmm. the structure, the, um, the teamwork, the, um, the drive to win, the drive to deliver results. And so what happened was through a series of life events then, um, either through sickness or death or anything like that, we just made a decision that we, it would be much more fun to do something with somebody you loved than to be off on your own and not and miss an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I left uh, corporate to come back here. And I see this kind of as my mission work mm -hmm. is now to lead others into, um, into positions. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what do you feel makes you a good recruiter? So because like, you've been able to recruit some kids to come swim at Queens that were also getting recruited by Auburn. Oh, and yeah. we just you know, landed two, two and kids in the top 15, 20 in the world. And I that mean, doesn't happen at Division two schools. Nah. Not typically, I should say. Well, I think what, because I don't know any better. But here's what happens <laughs> is I have the faith that um, I have a good product. Mm -hmm. I have the faith. Or, so here's what makes a good recruiter. It's no BS. Mm -hmm. What makes a good recruiter is you got to have a good product. So like in anything, when you have a great coffee, mm -hmm. oh, uh, that's um, we'll get a little uh, paper towel here. But when somewhere. you have when you have a great coffee, um, and sorry about that. No um, but when you have a great coffee, um, what happens is you can sell it mm -hmm. because it's passion. You don't you just talk about it, and you talk to me about how you make um, this Ethiopian coffee, and um, and the fruity flavors. Mm -hmm. It. I'm interested. I can see your passion. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're telling me about a coffee that wasn't, that you weren't passionate or did yeah. not know about, and I saw you trying to fake your way through it or you're trying to read a script, I would probably not be sold on it. Mm -hmm. So tying it back to recruiting is I love Queens. I've been offered some positions or um, involved in some positions at some big Division One schools, and everything has something special about it but nothing has the package that Queens has. Mm -hmm. And so this university, the Charlotte setting, the people, mm -hmm. and um, the culture we have built, the system we built, is just so special that somebody, when we're able to talk about it, they feel it, mm -hmm. and they want to be a part of it. Do you think that might have been different had you been hired on to replace a coach yes. rather than to build a program completely from scratch. Absolutely. I tell everybody I empathize when I go out and give talks or we go out and do some different things or I consult on some things. I just consulted for a major, a Big Ten university a little bit. One of the things I say is um, one of the toughest things to do is, um, is change a culture versus build a culture. And changing a culture, you have to have a patience with you that... Um, you have to have a support and a patience that is not, is difficult in this day and age. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you two examples. Um, but you have to, nowadays, you have to um, manage the program you get mm -hmm. before you can lead the one you want <laughs> and develop. Yeah. And what happens is that's a lot of years. And you have a lot of people that will work against you when you set your expectations because your expectations, most likely, the reason you probably came in is because of something that was not going so well. Mm -hmm. So I have a former assistant of mine who's just taken over a big head coaching job um, at, uh, at in the Big Ten. And I've been helping him through, and he's got to change because he's got to be patient with these, um, with these athletes. Mm -hmm. So... When David came in, when I talked about the support group, David had an incredible support that whether this was true or not, he had administrators standing by him saying, we are ready not to compete at all this next year if we have to completely, if nobody has bought in. 
But to get to where we want to get to, that's what we're prepared to do. Swimming is a privilege, not a right. Well, that's an interesting concept when you have that support. It automatically brings trust and you sit there and say, I don't have anybody I can go complain to, so I better um, step in or step out. Nowadays, we, um, it's, I heard something on the radio on the way over here from, um, from a minister. He goes, nowadays, where when, when we grew up, you respected your parents because of their role and, and you aligned with your parents. Nowadays, the kids want the parents to align with them mm. and respect them. And that's the whole concept. It's reversed and, and it's so, it's different. You've got to, if you're starting a culture, and that's where my niche is, everything we did at Auburn, was almost seen as a startup because we got rid of so many yeah. and to recreate, even though it had been an established program. Even the GlaxoSmithKline portions, everything, every project that I did that I excelled at was almost a little bit of a startup. Mm. Um, everything I've done where we've had the most success has been a startup. Mm. So I hope that answers, I mean, it's a long story to get to your point. But. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it answers it well. It's, um, I didn't really have a follow up on that. That's that that pretty much um, pretty much answers it. Moving on to other things with leadership. What um, and you touched on a few of these things. What um, what do you think makes someone a good leader? Well, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I you know, I'm supposed to know, I'm supposed to know a few of these answers as far as what I think um, makes a good leader. But I'll tell you, uh, I've noticed as I've gotten older, there are so many different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's not one thing. And I used to be naive. And probably as I was cutting my teeth in leadership is, um, is uh, thinking that there was only one way. And that was being, um, uh, being authoritarian, being very um, telling, directing, being very directive. But what I've learned in our success that we've had in our short time here at Queens, how I've developed as a leader and started to recognize what makes good leaders mm -hmm. is this, um, the ability to be patient and adapt and to be able to adapt. Um, the ability to recognize. And, and I can give this example. I've now realized that the freshmen need the most of my attention because they're, they need more, directed, more direction. I need to be more directive to them. I need to have more hands-on. It's not that I micromanage them, but I need to have more frequent contact with our freshmen because our freshmen are coming and they don't know. So every corner they're going to turn, they don't know what's on the other side until that becomes pretty consistent. And the structure is can be seen over and over. Well, that structure can't be seen till they can complete a season. Mm -hmm. All right. Then I know I notice our sophomores need the next amount, <laughs> and this this almost makes sense, right? But what happens is they start to develop, and they still need direction, but they cut their teeth on partnerships, how they can start to um, have more of a dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, with the coach and do some different things. It's not a blind trust now because they know what's on the side of the corners, but what they need now is reinforcement that for two years it will be, the structure will be similar and they'll continue to improve. And they'll for two years see that we'll reward academics as high as we reward athletics. And for two years they'll see that we'll recruit a team that will help support them become mm -hmm. champions mm -hmm. and to compete. Then the junior year, it starts, it starts our journey and the mistakes that happen in a partnership. So the trust, the push-pull, uh, push and the um, um, where I start to ask questions, what do you need? Mm -hmm. What do you need, Freddie? What do you want um, in this? And they start to say they're not very decisive at that point. They start to say things like, um, I don't know what I want. Would you tell me, Coach, what you want? And I feel that in good leadership then, at that point, in that developing that partnership, now I'm starting to get them ready to push them out of the nest and fly, let them fly. Mm -hmm. So I sit there and say, be decisive. And, and you know what? I'm not going to give you the answer because what's going to happen is I want you to make that mistake so you know what it feels like so you can twist and tweak and then make it again. Mm -hmm. And then we move to the senior year where it's a full-on partnership. Coach, this is what I need and want. Okay, can I, can I have some input? Yeah, please. I also think you should add this. Your body has um, changed or 
this is what we're doing. This will help the team. Mm -hmm. And then we start to form and we laugh a lot more. We, we, we sit down and have talks like you and I, and we, we start to talk about how their experiences are going to help them in business. Mm -hmm. We start to talk with some of them about how it's going to help in marriage because they're getting engaged now. We start to talk about different things and about family. We start to talk in different ways that our conversation goes to a whole other level and much bigger than swimming, mm -hmm. but about values, about um, beliefs, about um, about leadership. Mm -hmm. So, and that that kind of gets me into my next two questions: is um, what are if you could boil it down, or I'm sure you probably have already. What are the core values of Queen Swimming? Well, core we have five. I mean, communication, mm -hmm. character, mm -hmm. what you do when nobody's watching, leadership, excellence, and um, service. And uh, we have one other, we do have six, but one, the other one is more of a, it's called a relentless sense of urgency, mm -hmm. which um, kind of, teeter, uh, is it a value, is it a, but we try to say we have a relentless sense of urgency when we come through the um, pool, uh, the locker room doors towards the pool to be 100% focused in the pool. And then we reverse that relentless sense of urgency to into the door to go into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So what happens is we are yes and, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are academically strong and performing at the highest level and academically strong and performing at the highest level. Uh, and how do those values intersect with the personal values of Jeff Dugdale? Well, they directly, <laughs> because here's what happens, is I'm a firm believer, just had this talk the other day. If you have to be different at work than when you are at home, then it's going to be a tough, um, tough road to go. Mm -hmm. You've got to, um, I was, I, I'm a big Navy SEAL. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big military. Um, I love following that leadership and, and those thoughts. And, mm -hmm. and um, I was watching a show the other day on the CIA and how they kind of morph in and out, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was um, uh, one of the CIA agent had to go undercover. And one of the things that was said, this was interesting in the movie, was they said, man, you're, as they were practicing the role that he was going to play undercover as he infiltrated the drug cartel, mm -hmm. is he basically said um, the answers were very similar to what his real life is. And the answer was when they said, whoa, that, that's, you know, that's, that's you. And he goes, you stay as close to the truth as you can so then you don't get caught in a lie mm -hmm. and so what I try to do in that scenario of a movie scene is you stay as close to who you are and um, so um, I try to surround myself with a board of directors in an inner circle and this comes from a little bit of the book by Brett Ledbetter and what drives winning is even with our athletes of making sure that you don't confuse who you are and what you do mm -hmm. And so if I can keep as simple as possible, um, <clears throat> using that movie theme, uh, our values, I, I try to keep the same value system for home. Now what changes with my value system at home, and it's a very slight change, is our team buys into the values here and they help develop our values and how we were going to win. And then we put around what great looks like. At home, we do the similar thing, but my girls have a say in what what drive what what is it that excites them so we may add to mm -hmm. um some of our values but we stick with the same five um moving in a bit of a different direction do you think good leadership is universal what i mean by that is if we fired steve kerr and put jeff dugdale as head coach of the golden state warriors would they go on and win championship or we fired tim cook and put jeff dugdale in charge of apple would Apple's earnings remain where they're at or improve? So it's funny that you used two Auburn grads as a... Uh, um, I didn't even know. Tim, didn't even Tim know. actually led the Auburn uh, pre-speech uh, pre with Aub um, the Auburn-Alabama game. Let me move this just a little bit. So, um, uh, so I, think, I think yes and no. Okay, so here's... That's that's a safe answer, right? And I don't like giving safe answers, but I believe in this one. I mean, you need some of the, the X's and O's knowledge, well, of course. No, but, but I think you don't. Um, so Tennessee just made a, an interesting move in an athletic director. They brought in Phil Fulmer. Mm. 
But Phil, you got to ask what what how what experience does he have to run a SEC conference program? I mean, an SEC uh, a program like Tennessee, that's one of the biggest in the country. Mm -hmm. He was, and a lot of people all say the same thing. Oh, he has a ton, and I'll say, tell me. And he said, they said they people love him. I'm like, okay. Now tell me what helps him run a kind. I mean, I mean, I I bring in a I I can bring an ambassador in to have that role, but you need somebody to run the X's and O's, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so let's reverse that and take that. If he if if it, if it's an ambassador they need right now then great on the president for recognizing they need an ambassador and then surround him with all the X's and O's and then um, make sure he is surrounded with people better than him that can give him the answers and that can get him and let him be an ambassador. If you need an X and O guy, then you make sure you surround him with some ambassadors and, and can be able to help him or her um, be able to convey how best to um, lead others. But to, to say that I could go into an apple is I definitely think I can recognize people, mm -hmm. I can recognize needs if I listen and hear. But what happens is if you're not in that space and you've never been in that space, so what, what you're missing is the people, what energizes them is like in an apple, I could um, only imagine what energizes apple people is the innovation and the entrepreneurship of um, creativity. Mm -hmm. Well, if I come in and I can't be myself because they work best from 10.30 at night until 2 in the morning, but I'm a guy that's from 4.30 in the morning till 6 at night, mm -hmm. then we're going to have, um, and I can't fake that. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that's, I mean, if I'm going to be my best for them, then we're going to be opposing each other. I see that. Mm -hmm. So I think a good leader has to have a good self-awareness as to where they can best lead. Otherwise, they'll get minimized and nobody will ever get to see if you're rocked back on your heels mm -hmm. and it takes me too long to learn that space, um, the one, I, will, I won't get a chance to show what my leadership can do. Now, recognizing people and leading people can all be similar mm -hmm. to a certain point. But then you have to, for them to buy in to shorten that leap of faith in trust, you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's universal. I think what it is, is leaders are most effective in the spaces that they can. Um, now, you can cross industry. Mm -hmm. um, because let's say you, you're in a clothing industry, you led a major clothing industry, and you came out into a um, sporting good. Mm -hmm. you, you can learn that. But because it was kind of similar, there are some similarities. But to be universal, where you could um, cross to an apple to a, um, the other example you gave was um, uh, to apple to MBA. MBA. Um, MBA, I feel would be more similar. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I could go to the MBA, and um, and I could surround myself with a staff of twenty five. I'm or not 25, but I could surround myself with a staff of um, six. And if I put Michael Jordan and I put some of the uh, that yeah. gained instant trust, yeah. I would automatically gain that trust because they came to work for me. Sure. And when they did that, um, I could I could then lead the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to lead a workout for them to trust me. I, I could lead the bigger picture and the vision of what's mm -hmm. going on. Do you think leadership in an individual sport like swimming is different than... A team sport like um, no basketball or football or no. soccer um, I, I see what you're going but I don't think so because when we get into the collegiate ranks even the individual sports are a team sport mm -hmm. so um, I do believe that so um, do I are there intricacies yes there are there are some little things that you have to be aware of in the team mm -hmm. and in the team sport what you have to be more aware of is the role players mm -hmm. But even in our sport, everyone has a role. Mm -hmm. But more so in team sports, you have Steph Curry, and then you surround him with roles, players. Mm -hmm. You have Durant, mm -hmm. and you have all your players. You have Green. You have all the different. Mm -hmm. um, you have the people that play the roles. You have. You have um, at. Uh, 
Cleveland, you have your, I mean, you have James, I mean, you have uh, King James there, and then you have the role players, right? So now you bring in Wade, and Wade is older, but he knows how to feed the ball. He has a vision that nobody, that has made him great, and he can be old now because, and when I say old, old for the profession, but what he is bringing is a maturity. No, he's, I think he's, is he? I don't, I don't know. know, but he. Um, I should know. What he does is, um, he he has a role. Mm-hmm. He's not going there to be the scoring leader. Mm-hmm. And when you know that, then you're going to thrive. Mm-hmm. What where the conflict comes is when he wants to be the scoring leader, and I mean, you have too many people become want to be the scoring leaders. And thinking back to Golden State, I think when when Steve Kerr was first hired on, I remember um, them talking about like that that transition, and he one of one of his biggest like hallmarks of his success early in his career at Golden State was convincing Andre Iguodala that he would be best coming off the bench, and where he's been, you know, a twenty five a night guy for and starting small forward for years, it took him a couple months to believe in that vision and. I, I just remember no, that story and, and, and then up. and then you what happens is you you've got to know as I tell some of my athletes is I know you better than you know yourself. Mm-hmm. You got to trust me. Now, if we try it, here's where a coach can go wrong. Here's where a leader can go wrong. If someone then develops enough trust to follow you down that path, and it's not working, then as a leader you've got to be vulnerable enough to say, I thought I saw this. Let's go back to your way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but if you like don't do that, then what happens? Yeah, it's tough on an ego. It's tough on a lot of things. But if it doesn't happen, then you lose not only the trust of that one that individual that you're trying to lead, but then they talk in the locker room. And mm-hmm. our theme is championships are won in the locker room. We do everything. The NCAA keeps us to 20 hours a week, four hours a day. Mm-hmm. And everything is the same. But what's, our, what's, what's the thing that changes us? How we talk in that locker room. Mm-hmm. And where the other teams that could even possibly train harder than us could possibly have something different than us with more money. But when they go in the locker room, if they tear themselves down, if they talk negative, if they don't do the right things, then they, it, none of that matters. Mm-hmm. So, um, Moving on from leadership stuff, um, and this is, kind of brings up my final uh, line of questions here. What are, what are um, for yourself personally and for the Queen's program, what are your goals? Yeah, our goals, our goals are to, um, well, personally for me, is to build, um, first as a swim coach, to build a program that is, has an armor of love. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I want um, one of the, one of the greatest things I heard the, not too long ago from an alumni is, uh, that was a way is I want to get my way back to Charlotte. I want it to where we're all together and we can take care of each other. Mm-hmm. That's that's an armor of love. That's a uh, that means they had a great experience here. Mm-hmm. So, and part of that experience is to constantly put ourselves in a position to win for ch- win championships. That putting ourselves in that is preparing, giving us experiences to win or lose, to prepare us for the real life, to be competitive. Mm-hmm. And that's what we need to do, right? And that's how you can take care of your family. And that's how you can take care of your spouse. And that's how um, partners or different things like that. You can do that by if you have those qualities. Now, for that's my goal as a, as a coach, to be sustainable. Mm-hmm. The legacy I want to leave is could we win, can we win, will we win, and gosh darn it, I'm trying to set it up so we can win, is if I'm if it's beyond me, if I'm not here, I want Queens to still be winning. Mm-hmm. Um, as an administrator now, as an athletic director, my goal is to how can I help every other team win? Mm-hmm. And we just came off our best fall season with four or five teams making the NCAA tournament mm-hmm. and us being in the top ten mm-hmm. of the um, Learfield Cup already in the first semester. We've never done that in the first semester. Now going into the fall, we have two number one rankings in swimming and basketball at number two. And uh, women's basketball just on the outside been getting better. And then our spring should be strong as well. And with that is um, leading that threshold of excellence to where 
we can thrive academically, yes, academically and athletically. Mm -hmm. And at a school of 1,500 plus, where we can lead that Learfield Cup and have the individual national championship trophy represents our success in the sport, but the excuse me, the Learfield represents the success as a department mm -hmm. and as a school, and that's what I want. Because then we become locally relevant, we become regionally relevant, we become nationally relevant, mm -hmm. and more importantly, we become globally relevant. Mm -hmm. So. Um, your goals, uh, you listed it as, um, I call it sort of process goals, things that are ongoing, things that you strive for. It, it's not necessarily like, you know, that's my goal, it's there, it's done. Yeah. Um, but if you if you accomplish your goals, what do you do next? Yeah, well, that's the, that's why they are a little bit more process now, because it's it's gone moved from the dream of winning. Right, it's about the when journey. When you're winning, it's about now the process of how do we control um, the sustainable. Okay. And so it, it, your goals, in if you don't know how to change those, then that's going to be a problem because uh, I could say I want to win 12 national championships because that's what my mentor did. Mm -hmm. But um, what fulfills me right now at six, and actually... Um, Again, Sunny is our, but I oversee triathlon, so we have another three with triathlon. Um, that, I mean, what helped with nine national championships is, mm -hmm. I know I can win. Mm -hmm. And that's not the thing. It's, can I build a program for somebody else? Can I build a program for our, uh, an alumni to come in here? Can I build a program? We were, we were just talking about goals. Um... This is going in a different direction. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh boy, I've received so much. Um, I've been blessed with so many good mentors that I've re um, received. Um, the best advice I've ever received. Um, wow. I'm trying to categorize them here. Mm. I, I would think that the best advice I ever got was to surround myself with people better than me. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, um, that's nerve wracking. That's probably the number one thing I think in leadership that where it can go wrong mm -hmm. is you can have a great leader if they're constantly, if they're not willing to be challenged by people, if they do not see and are not comfortable with feedback and not comfortable with, um, with uh, recognizing how so, yeah, so to surround themselves with people better than them, mm -hmm. it they will they will find themselves doing too much. And if I I have surrounded myself with such great people that I believe are better than me in so many ways, it allows me to leverage my strength and to constantly keep my eyes on the horizon and how we can keep getting better. And so, but if I'm involved in such the daily grind and minutia of everything. Mm -hmm then I, I will not be able to see at the horizon. To, and then what we'll do is we'll find ourselves in a position where we're not competing for national championships and asking ourselves what went wrong, and I'll probably be able to circle right back to where I had to, where I lost people who were better than me. And that goes back to what you were talking about earlier with, like, knowing your blind spots. Oh, exactly. And, um, and more important is, is every two years I like to run personality testing on yeah. our... On yeah. our and um, I, do you remember that? Or, mm -hmm. yeah, because I like it's it's more importantly blind spots are important to identify, but more importantly the unknowns is what you need to rely on. The unknowns are critical and dangerous because if you fail to realize that you um, you're not a good listener, mm -hmm. if you want to say you're a listener and you're not a good listener, that's an unknown. If you if you, a blind spot is if you say, man, I try to be a good listener, but I struggle with it, that's a blind spot. But an unknown is, I am a good listener, and you're actually not, mm -hmm. that is gonna drive you right down a path of lack of trust, they're not gonna have trust in you, they're not gonna have um, a lot of different things, because they're gonna see your self-awareness and question it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, I like to try as many things and to do as many things and to ask the critical questions to my staff who I trust. What is it that I'm not aware of that I need to be better at? Mm -hmm. As and, a coach, um, there's a lot because, like you were saying, the, the, you're limited on hours. 
and you can't be, you know, you can't be after, you know, after class gets out in the cafeteria and the dorm exactly. rooms and stuff. There's so much time that you don't have control of. Exactly. That you are not aware of. Exactly. So that's, I guess that's what my, uh, where my thought process is on that. If you could have a conversation with the 18 year old Jeff Dugdale, <laughs> what advice would you give that kid? Gosh, I don't know because I had such a different life, but, um, and I would hate to say if I had this conversation it'd probably change my life. But at 18 year old, at 18 years old, um, I find myself having a conversation with my 18, well now 19 year old daughter, mm. um, that I sit there and I'm reminded by my family saying, do you hear yourself giving this talk to your daughter? I mean, that is what we try to tell you. I'd probably say because I was fast forwarded into life so much, mm. like kind of like you, Freddie, how you've, you've taken, you've had such a passion for entrepreneurship and to business that you've, you've taken leaps that nobody your age probably um, very few, a small 1% that, um, that feel they're in a position to do that yet. Well, what happens is you're doing some things that are uncomfortable, you're doing some things that are scary, um, but here's the deal. I would have told myself 18 at 18 to um, reconnect with my 18-year-old friends mm. and be 18. I was always interested in being 30. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. always interested in, um, in my wedding party, my average age was about 41 when we were 20 so. I mean, I've always been in fascinated with the older or with a more wise and older person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of the great leadership I had with my dad. And there were obviously there were mistakes there, but there were on all sides. But here's what happened is my dad taught me the value of mentorship. I always saw my dad with somebody older and wiser surrounding himself, telling them about business. My mm -hmm. dad's an engineer and a construction. And um, I can remember all these men in his life that were older that he was taking care of and they were taking care of him. Mm. And meaning, um, you know, talking about business, about mistakes, mm. about um, where, how it's evolving. And that's what I value now as well. Um, uh, so we um, are going from there. That's, um, that's what we're doing. So that's... Uh, I think that's my big thing is I tell my 18 year old self is to not be in a hurry to be yeah. 31 to 41 is yeah. that it would be there. But then again, I feel like I'd miss opportunities that I wouldn't have because yeah. Coach Marsh, if I said I didn't want to retire and want to stay with my 18 year old friends, then what would happen is um, he would have to hire someone else and then that would probably go from there. But he brought me in and did, he got creative. And I mean, a huge risk. Who hires a student as your assistant coach? I mean, it, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. So it's recognizing talent, it's understanding it and it's going, but I tell my daughter right now, because I see so much of her and me mm. is to slow down, mm. to relax. You have the rest of your life in front of you. You are not, we're only given today. We're never promised tomorrow to relax. But and then I sit there and go, <laughs> I didn't do that. Why would I expect her to do right. it? Right. So that, <laughs> le that leads me into the, the, the final question is, um, if there's an 18-year-old out there who says, hey, I want to be Jeff Dugdale when I grow up, what do you tell that kid? Well, I tell them to get a good, strong man, to get a lot of mentors, mentors and I yeah. tell them to go and experience things. Um, if you want to, if you think you want to go and become an EMT before you go through, um, before you do that, mm -hmm. go ride down the ambulance. Mm -hmm. Find some, if you want to be a surgeon, go into surgery. If you don't, don't waste a second of your life to only find out that's not what you want. Go and experience, go do some things. Be in a position to not be, um, to where you can volunteer. Mm -hmm. And see how things are um, when you're not paid for and you feel like you have to do them. Mm -hmm. Go out and try things, do things. And when you do that, you can learn a lot about yourself. And um, it helps direct you, it helps it helps you identify where you thrive mm -hmm. and where you start to feel bogged down. And I say live in that zone where you thrive. Yeah. <laughs> Surround yourself with people who can, can um, uh, teammates who can who thrive in the areas that bog you down, mm -hmm. and then you you praise them and reward them uh, for that, and and while well, you can continue to thrive at a different area. Mm. 
go and do things, experience it. Oh, travel, do what, yeah. learn, be aware. Um, be aware and, and develop a self-awareness yes. so that you know that you're not doing it for the money, you're not doing it for whatever. What are you doing it for? And then everything else will follow. When you're having a good time, you're passionate, you're thriving, everything just, it's almost like a magnet follows you. Mm -hmm. So much of what you talked about today goes back to self-awareness. Oh, it is. So many people, that one of my biggest pet peeves, and this isn't one of your questions, is people who lack self-awareness. Mm. Is, is because I sit there and say, well, how do I get you to see, how do I get you to look in a mirror? Because I can't coach, I can't be the best version of myself if it's constantly hitting a garage door. Right? Right. I mean, you've got to open that door to be able to sit there and say, and that's why, well, you know, I'm going to go back to questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of the best advice I ever got with yeah. is um, from one of my old bosses who said to me, said, Jeff, if it's really hard for you to get advice because sometimes you know when you think you're doing so well and you're a top one percenter or you're a top of something that you get a lot of feedback if that hurts a little bit and stings um then find a way because you have to have it to mm -hmm. be better and to continue to thrive find a way to accept it and swallow it a little bit better mm -hmm. so i took that to heart because in young and and um competitive i didn't as long as i was winning yeah. My way was the only way. Mm -hmm. But what happened is, is so then I said, you know what? I found a way. He challenged me to find a way. So I would proactively ask for feedback. If I was asking for it, it was on my terms versus somebody giving it to me. Right. We want. So if I feel like we're at a moment, I become self-aware. Like, I need some. If my boss, I'm like, my boss is going to give me some feedback, then I'm going to proactively say, how can you help me be better? You have some great experiences to make me better. Mm -hmm. What have you seen in my behaviors that would make me better? Well, that means I'm telling her that I recognize I may have done some things, mm -hmm. and I'm telling uh, and I'm saying give it to me because I asked for it. Mm -hmm. So I should, if I'm going to ask for something, I better be able to take it. Yeah. So. Um, and I will always cherish Wallace Fargo's name when he gave me that fee, he gave me that he said you know it's not easy and, but the more as you climb the ladder you're going to get more and more feedback you're going to think some of it's fair you're going to think some of it's not fair because they don't know the whole story but it is what they've seen in the time frame they've seen it mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't know the be um, and you don't need to give them an explanation of the story before or the after it is what it is so what you need to do, if that's going to hurt, if that don't let that bog you down, find a way to accept it and learn from it. And I sat there and I thought, wow, that's pretty good because I do. I want to tell the story a lot of times when somebody gives me feedback going, what you saw is real, but let me tell you what happened the two weeks before and the right, two weeks right, after right, as right, to right. why I did. That doesn't matter. It's what they saw is their optics. And what happens is if I notice something's going to go and a question's coming or feedback's coming my way, quickly ask and say, hey, what did you see that could make us better? Mm. <laughs> then it changes the whole value of how you get your feedback. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's not for everyone. That's just for me. That that was the challenge I received and I appreciate it. Very cool. So very cool. Well thank you so much. No problem.